Hi there, so welcome back. This is lecture three of machine learning from data and uh, we're going to address this important topic of is learning feasible? And you know, we'll, we'll, we'll cover why that's a relevant question. And it's a very important question because if it's not feasible, we're done. Quickly, a recap from last time. So last time what we did was we introduced the perceptron learning model okay, where you know, we, are, we derived the perceptron by thinking about how a person will assign credit as a linear combination of features. You take, you know, you take the, you compare to a threshold that gives us a sign of W transpose X. And then we, we showed that, okay, how to pick, uh, that defined a hypothesis set, an uncountable hypothesis set. How to pick one, you need a criterion. So the criterion was, does it, does a, does the hypothesis look good on the data? And the algorithm was the perceptron learning algorithm. And, you know, we showed that at least computationally, when the data is separable, we can find it. We can find a good separator. Okay. But that doesn't mean that the separator we find, you know, approximates F. It approximates F on the data set. So today, we're specifically going to address this issue of what happens outside the data set. Now, I've had a lot of questions asking, you know, you, 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 in the learning setup, you forced us to, to pick the hypothesis set ahead of time. And I'm claiming that this is without loss of generality. And someone pointed out to me, you know, but these commercial machine learning packages and so on and so forth, you know, they, they ask you to, you know, they, they, to, to present them with the data, then they show you the data, and um, and you, they show you some statistics of each indi individual variable, and then you get to pick between, let's say, the, per the, the, the perceptron, the linear regression, you want to do logistic regression, you want to use a polynomial model, you want to use a support vector machine, you want to use a neural network. So it gives you all this choice, and you pick one. Okay. And the key is it's showing you some data, and and then on the basis of that, you sort of pick a, a, a model to use, and then it goes and does some automated thing and produces a final hypothesis. So two things. The first thing is that that commercial setup is equivalent or, or can be placed within our framework with the, with the simple realization, with the simple observation that effectively before you saw the data, your fixed hypothesis set was the union of all those things they were showing you. Okay. So think what happens before you look at the data. That commercial software you know, has the set of options which are, you know, uh, linear model, logistic, polynomial, neural network, support vector machine. So it has all of those. So you collect all of those into one big hypothesis set. Okay? And that's the fixed hypothesis set that you have before you look at the data. Okay? Now, it turns out that the learning algorithm they were implementing was something somewhat sophisticated. It had a manual part where you got to pick a sub-hypothesis set based on, you know, exploration of the data. And then it had this automated part where it took the, the sub-hypothesis set and produced a single hypothesis. No problem. The point we're asking you to do, okay, is to be upfront and to be explicit and just simply say, this is the hypothesis set I'm working with, okay? And it's always the case that there is a hypothesis set you're working with at, at, in the background, okay? And you must be explicit and stated, and then the, the theory says that that's, that sets a boundary for where you can go. You cannot select a final, final hypothesis outside that boundary. Okay. That's very important. So we're just saying, be explicit, be upfront, tell us what's your hypothesis set. Okay. It can be a large hypothesis set like that commercial system, or it can be a small one, like you say, I'm just going to fix it to the perceptron. Okay. But whatever it is, tell us what it is. Then we can do the theory. Okay. Now, one of the, one of the things that's, you know, you, that might lead you to sort of, uh, to, to realize that, you know, they may not be operating in, in that realm is that, you know, what do they present you at the end? They present you the final hypothesis and maybe show you how well it does on the data. Okay. And if they're going to show you how well it's going to do outside the data, then it's very dangerous what they did. What they did was to, you know, ask you to pick and then, you know, uh, run a polynomial model and then, you know, uh, see how it does on the data. And then maybe they'll try to figure out, well, well what do we expect outside the data? And what we will see in the theory is that, you know, when you're trying to analyze outside the data, you have to go back to the original hypothesis set, which is all the hypotheses. And so if you have to go back to the original hypothesis set, which is all the hypotheses, when it's time to see what's going to happen outside the data from the theoretical perspective, you might as well be upfront from the very beginning and state your hypothesis set that defines the boundaries from which you can pick a final hypothesis. Okay. Now, let's talk about is learning feasible? And last time we ended with this fascinating puzzle okay, where I asked humans, and you were the humans, so you can't say, oh, did you pick the right humans? Did you pick some silly human? Why did you guys? Unless you think you guys are not the right humans, you know. I picked you guys, and you guys couldn't agree on what the test point is. And there's a very simple reason why you couldn't agree. 
the, the simple reason why you couldn't agree is there are many explanations of the data, okay, that will will that will result in this out of some this outside the data point being plus one, and there are many examples that are many explanations of the data that will result in minus one. So the target function being plus or minus one is equally consistent on the outside data point is equally consistent with all possible explanations of the data. Okay. And this is one of the things you you sort of investigated in one of the exercises. Okay. And and if the target function is truly unknown, okay, then how are we going to pin it down outside the data? Because all we have is the data, and the data is equally consistent with the target function being plus one outside the data for this particular point, and also minus one outside the data. And that's a real dilemma. Okay, so let me summarize. We have a very simple problem, okay? But it got very messy. Humans cannot agree on what is the right value of f outside the data. Okay? And that's because either value of f is equally consistent with the data. Okay? And that's sometimes called no free lunch. Okay, so what now? Okay. This raises the question, to, if f is truly unknown, is there any hope whatsoever that a finite data set can, learn, can help us to know anything about f outside the data? Okay. If it can truly take on either value outside the data, then how does the data help? So, it turns out, and luckily for us, the answer is yes, okay, but if we're willing to give up the for sure, okay, so we will never know for sure what's going on outside the data, but if we're willing to give up the for sure, if we're willing to live in a world of very high probability, okay, I'm almost certain but not quite sure, then we can you know, say something about outside the data. So our goal for this lecture is twofold. The first is to see what can we say outside the data, okay, and we're going to uh, uh, reduce the problem from the full learning problem to a much simpler problem, okay? and then we're going to connect that simpler problem to learning and leave it at that for today. Okay? So, can we infer something, anything whatsoever, however small, something outside the data using only the data? Okay? And let's go to the board okay? because I want to. I, I want to write in order to in order to slow myself down. This is a very important topic. Okay, so let's try to figure out if we, if we can learn something out of the data. This is very important because out of the data is the only thing we care about. So I'm going to go slowly and, and so try to pay attention. So we're going to simplify the problem and, and, and address a much simpler problem in, uh, in the context of learning. Okay, and, and that's the Gallup poll or sampling. So think, you know, in the November election, you know, we'd like to know who's going to win the election. So what we do, we go out and sample some, you know, uh, potential voters and ask them how are they going to vote. Okay, now we get this sample and we see how many vote for Trump and how many vote for Biden. And then we're going to estimate from this, you know, how many, who's going to win the election. Okay, so let's, you know, build an abstract model of sampling. Okay. And in this abstract model, there's the, the, what's called the population or the collection of voters. We'll just call that a bin. Okay, so you have a bin. Okay, and in this bin, you have two different kinds of voters. So we'll call the voters marbles. So, you know, the, 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 the people who are voting for Biden, we'll call them the green marbles. And the people who are voting for Trump, we'll call them the red marbles. So in this bin, we have a collection of different colored marbles. Some of them are red, some of them are green. So you've got a bunch of green marbles. Okay, and you've got a bunch of red marbles. So this is an abstract model of the Gallup poll, or it's a model of sampling, sampling with replace, sampling with replacement to be technically accurate. Okay. Now in this bin, you know, we have you know some red and some green. Let us say that the fraction of red marbles is mu. Okay, so mu equals fraction of red marbles. Okay. And just for argument's sake, just to be concrete, let's imagine that it's equal to 0 0.4. Now, here's what sampling does. When you sample, you go and randomly pick a sample. Okay, so imagine that each marble has a pro probability associated with it. And then, you know, we pick, we pick a marble according to that probability distribution. And then we replace it. We pick a marble according to that same probability distribution and replace it. So we repeatedly pick marbles. Okay, so that's called sampling. So we sample. And we generate what's called a sample of marbles. And some of the marbles we generate will be green, 
Okay. And some of the marbles we generate will be red. Okay. And in this example, I picked 10 marbles and three of them are red and seven of them are green. Okay. Now, we don't know what's going on in the bin. Okay. That's all the people in the USA in, as, a, as an application in the, in the, in the Gallup poll example. But we know exactly what's going on in the sample. So in the sample, okay, which we can consider to be our data, so this is our data. So in the sample, we know we can compute the fraction of red marbles. Okay. Can certainly compute it because for each member, and that's exactly what the Gallup poll does. For each member of the sample, we are going to ask, "Who did you vote for?" Okay, or "Who are you going to vote for?" Or in this abstract model, once we pick the marble, we can look at its color. Okay, so we know the color of all these marbles. So let's define the fraction of red marbles in my data as new fraction of red in sample slash data. And in this example, just to be concrete, in this example, it's 0 0.3. Okay. Now, important. New, I know. So we can call this inside the data. Okay. And it's nice to know that, you know, I sample 10 people and three of them are red. Three of them are Trump voters. That's nice to know. But that's not really what I want to know. Okay. What I really want to know is who's winning the election, i.e., I want to know the fraction of people in the population who are voting for Trump. I, I want to know the I want to know the fraction of red marbles in the bin. I want to know mu. Okay. So nu is inside the data, it's known. Mu is outside the data. Why outside the data? Because to compute mu, I need to know the colors of marbles. In fact, I need to know the colors of all the marbles. I need to know the colors of marbles that are not in my data. So it's related to outside the data. So mu is outside the data. Okay. And it's unknown. Okay. So it's unknown. And so here's a very simple learning from data problem. Much simpler than, you know, learning an entire target function. Okay. All I would like to know is what is the fraction of red marbles in the bin, which is an outside the data quantity. And all I know, okay, what I know from the data is the fraction of red marbles in the data new. So the question is, can I reach from my data new into the bin mu somehow and infer mu. Can I reach from from nu to mu? Okay. Now, you know, when we do these Gallup polls, of course, they don't take samples of size 10. Okay. They'll take a sample of size, let's say a thousand, ten thousand. So they'll poll about ten thousand people. Okay. Now, <clears throat> is it the case that I could say mu equals mu? So this is what we do when we believe in a Gallup poll. So is it, is it true that uh, mu equals or is approximately equal to, let's say, mu? Okay. And here's the bad news. The bad news is we can never say for sure. In other words, it is always possible. Okay. It is, it is all, it, it is possible for bin to be mostly, let's say, red, so that means mu is approximately equal to 1, yet sample is all green, so nu is approximately equal to 0. It is always possible, you just got unlucky, okay, by just by chance, when you were picking your sample of size 10, even though most of these guys are red, okay, you happen to pick 10 green marbles. It is always possible. And we can replace 10 with a 1,000. It is still always possible. So that you're very, very unlucky. And we can replace a 1,000 with a 100,000. And it is still possible that you pick all 100,000 green. And you are very, 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 very unlucky. And you should not buy a lottery ticket. Okay. But the point is, it is still, or it is still possible. Okay. So we cannot for sure make any conclusions about mu. Okay. In fact, 
Okay, just like our little machine learning problem where, you know, on the data, you, it, you can get explanations of the data that are equally consistent with f being plus one versus, you know, explanations that are consistent with f being minus one. Mu taking on any value from zero to one, okay, but not, in, not including zero and one. So any sort of non-trivial value between zero and one, mu can take on any non-trivial value between zero and one and be consistent with whatever data set you get. Okay, and, and that was sort of where we left it off with that example, okay, where we were, where we were, where we were led to this question, is learning feasible? So it looks like it's not possible, okay, to make any conclusions about mu given mu. It's not possible if we want our conclusion to be for sure 100% correct. Okay, but now let me show you what's going to, what's going on in this experiment. Okay, instead, let's say we, you know, let's say we picked, instead of 10 marbles, we picked a thousand marbles. Okay, let me show you what's going on in this experiment. But in order to show you what's going on in this experiment, we must realize that, you know, when we do this experiment once, you know, random things can happen. So let's imagine we repeat this experiment over and over and over again. So pick a thousand marbles. Okay, look at the fraction of red. Pick an, uh, replace them. Pick again, thousand marbles. Look at the fraction of red. Replace them. Pick again. Pick again. Pick again. So do, repeat this experiment many, 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 many times. Okay. So let me show you what can possibly happen. Okay. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to draw on the x-axis. I'm going to draw the possible values of new. Okay, from zero to one. So when I draw a thousand marbles, it's possible that I get zero red. It's possible that I get a thousand red. And it's possible for me to get pretty much anything in between at a resolution of 0 0.001. Now here's where mu sits. So mu is 0 0.4. Okay. Now let's say I do this experiment once. Okay, do it once and I see what value of, uh, of, of new did I get. Maybe I got 0.3. So I'll, you know, I'll put a little check mark there. I'll put a little X mark here. So let's say this is point. Well, let, I won't get point three. I might get, let's say, point three nine. Okay, so I'll put a little X mark here. Okay, now let me re repeat it. Maybe I get point four. So I'll put a little X mark here. Okay, maybe I get point four one. I'll put an X mark here. Okay, maybe I get, I repeat it again. So I get point four. And I get point four, point four, point three nine. And point three nine, point four, point three nine nine, point four zero one. 0 0.401, 0.401, 0.4, 0.4, 0.4, 0.399, 0.399, 0 0.401, and so on. I get things that are very close to 0 0.4, okay? And I get things that are, you know, but occasionally I might get, you know, something out here. Occasionally. And occasionally I might get something out here. I might get a new equals to 0.5, okay? But then I'll get mostly guys that are in here. These guys will happen most of the time, okay? And, and so on. Okay, and so on, and I'll get a few here. Okay, maybe occasionally I'll get one here, one here, one here, one here. Okay, so this is an example of my, what might happen if I repeated this experiment many, 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 many times. Okay, what it shows you is that, you know, yes, it's possible to get all possible values of mu. Okay, in which case, you cannot really in, uh, con, uh, infer anything about mu because you can get mu equals zero, you can get mu equals one, and in these cases, mu is not close to mu. But most of the time when I repeat this experiment, I'm in a world, okay, that's good. Okay, most of the time you will find that mu is very, very, very close to mu, especially if you sample a thousand. In fact, if you repeat this experiment, you know, and, 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 and take it to the limit, you know, you, you find what's called a very, very spiked distribution that looks something like this. Okay. Interesting. Okay. And now this distribution has a name. It's called a binomial. Okay. And because we are sampling, our sample size is so large, n equals a thousand, this is approximate, it is well approximated by a Gaussian. Okay. And now I want to highlight two kinds of things that can happen. A good thing can happen when I run this experiment. Okay. So imagine that if the new that I get is within, let's say, epsilon of mu. Okay. So in, in this region, okay, so you know, if, if, if nu happens to fall in this region, which is let's say mu plus some small value epsilon and mu minus some small value epsilon, I'll say a good thing happened. The sample was good. Okay. This is good. Okay. 
Okay. And then there's the other thing that can happen, which is the sample is bad. Okay. So the sample is bad. Okay. So in this good, in this good outcome, okay, nu minus mu is less than or equal to epsilon. Okay. So nu is a is tightly linked to mu, and if I were if I were in this good world, if, if, if a good thing had happened, okay, then, and, and I made the claim that, you know, mu is equal to nu, then I wouldn't be far off. Okay? On the other hand, a bad thing can happen, and it's possible that a bad thing can happen. So, so in this region, bad. And in this region, bad. Okay, and you'll see what's going on in this region, though. You know, in this region, if, if my sample happened to be such that, you know, nu is far from mu, and I claimed you know, I believe the Gallup poll. I claim that, okay, mu is the observed value of nu, let's say 0.6. I would be far off. I would be wrong. So in this bad world, I cannot believe the Gallup poll. I cannot look at the Gallup poll and claim that mu is equal to that value. So in this bad world, uh, nu minus mu is greater than epsilon. Nu minus mu is greater than epsilon. Okay. Okay. So there's the good world, and then there's the bad world. And the bad world is possible. But when you look at this picture, you see that by far, it's overwhelmingly more likely that I'm in the good world and that I can, you know, conclude by after observing nu that, you know, that's the value of mu. And if, and, and with an overwhelmingly high likelihood, I will be correct. And that's why we believe Gallup polls. Okay. Not because they are always right, but because, you know, almost all the time, you, they, they will be right. Okay. And if n becomes very, very large, it's almost a probability one that the, the Gallup poll will be right, but there is still a small probability that it can be wrong. Okay. And if you're in this Gallup poll world where the Gallup poll is very far off, then you're a very, very, very unlucky person. Don't ever buy a lottery ticket. Okay. So, can we pin this down mathematically? Can we pin down this picture mathematically? And the answer is yes. Okay. And it is a gift from Hufting. And now I'm going to just state the gift from Hufting and I'm going to go through it slowly because it is a complicated formula, but it is a very, 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 very important formula. Okay. So. A gift from Hufting. Wassily Hufting. A gift. From Hufti. Okay. Now, okay, the reason we believe in this Gallup poll and in sampling in general is because we believe that the good thing happens very, very often. Okay. Or we believe that the bad thing happens with a very low probability, almost zero. Okay. And that's what Hufti was able to show. But he wasn't able to compute this probability because it's a complicated binomial. But what he was able to show was an upper bound on this probability. So Huffing came and said, you know what? The probability when you run this experiment that you'll be in a bad situation. So the probability that you will be in a bad situation. Okay, now what does bad mean? The bad means that, you know, you would be very wrong if you claimed that the population fraction of red is equal to the observed sample fraction of red. So bad means that the probability, you know, the bad thing happens if nu minus mu is greater than epsilon. So that's what bad means. Okay. So he said that the probability that you are in a bad situation, i.e. the probability that these guys deviate a lot and then the first question you should say, whoa, 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 what is this epsilon? And that's what's interesting in this bound, in this, in this, in this Hufting bound. Well, that's up to you to define what bad means. Okay. So if you observed nu equals 0 0.63. Okay. And you know, uh, you said that mu, so therefore you conclude mu equals 0 0.63, but then you find out that mu equals 0 0.7. Okay. So then the deviation between these two in absolute value, the deviation is 0 0.07. Is that good or bad? Are you happy or sad? Okay. And, 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 and so it's up to you to define what level of deviation you're willing to live with. 
i.e. it's up to you to define what this epsilon is. And okay, a typical choice for epsilon might be something like, you know, 0 0.1. Okay, so this is a relatively, you know, you know, you're a, you're a relatively lax guy. Okay, you know, if you said that mu, if you said that mu is 0 0.6 and the actual value is 0 0.5, you're happy, you're not sad. Okay, 10% off. Okay. okay, another typical choice for epsilon is 0 0.05, so you're willing to tolerate a 5% deviation in, in your estimate, in your inference. You're, you're willing to tolerate a 5% error. And another popular choice is epsilon equals 0 0.01, so 1%. So if you claim that it's, you know, for, that, the, that the population fraction is 0 0.4 and it's actually 0 0.39, no problem. But if it's 0 0.38, you're not happy. Okay. That's a pretty strict, you know, requirement. You have very high standards. Okay. But it's up to you. You define what it means to be bad. Okay. So what it means, it means to be bad. Okay. And then this is exactly the definition of a bad situation. And what Hafting said, that the probability of a bad situation is small. That's what he said. Okay. But now, of course, he's a mathematician. He didn't just say small. Is, so to show that something is small, you're going to show that it's less than or equal to something small. And you're going to show that it's less than or equal to something small. And then what's, what's, what's you know, a parameter in this sampling problem that we could use in order to control how small something is? Well, the number of data points is certainly a, a valid candidate because, you know, we, we certainly are believing more and more in the Gallup poll when the size of the sample gets larger and larger. And indeed, that is the case. Okay. Indeed, you know, this something small gets smaller and smaller as the sample size gets larger and larger. In fact, it gets much smaller when the sample size gets larger and larger. In fact, it's behaving exponentially with n. It's, so it's, this probability of a bad situation is at most, you know, e to some power which is negative of n. So there's n in the exponent. So for example, if you have 10, if you have 10 data points, this would be e to the minus 10. E to the minus 10. If you have a thousand data point, this is e to the minus a thousand. Wow. E to the minus a thousand. Forget about it. You know, the chances of it happening, uh, you know, if you wait for a bad thing to happen, if the chances of a bad thing happening are e to the minus a thousand, the universe will be gone by then. Okay. So e to the minus n. Okay. Well, unfortunately, there's bad news. Okay. Because you can look here, you see that certainly it should depend on what it means to be bad. If you're more strict, then the, the, the chances of a bad thing happening should go up. And indeed, that's the case. Bad news. Okay, there's an epsilon squared here. Okay, so it's e to the minus epsilon squared. And now you can see that this is really bad news. Because with epsilon equals 0 0.1, this number becomes, you know, 0 0.01. Okay? And so for this exponent to become large, you need n much, much greater than 1 over epsilon squared. If epsilon is 0 0.01, you need n much, much bigger than, you know, 10,000. Okay, so you need to sample at least 10,000, maybe 100,000. Okay, if you sample 100,000, then this becomes e to the minus 10. Wow, that's a small number. Okay, well, that's not quite correct either. Now we have some technical issues. So you have to put a 2 here, you have to put a 2 here. Okay. And now it's technically correct. So the form of the bound e to the minus epsilon squared n is roughly speaking correct and has all the right dependent. But, you know, there, there's a certain value to being truly mathematically correct. And, 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 and we have to put in those two. Okay, so now that's the bound. Okay. And that's the quantification of is small. So the probability of a bad thing happening is small. What's a bad thing? If you were to say that, you know, your observed nu is mu, you would be wrong. Then you're in a bad situation. And if that value is very, very small, then we can believe the Gallup poll. We can believe the sampler. Okay. And, and, and that's the picture that goes along with that formula, that bound. Okay. Um, sometimes it's nice to know also what's the probability that you're right. What's the probability of a good thing happening? Okay, and that's just the complement event. So when will you be correct in, 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 in ascribing mu to nu? So in inferring that, you know, mu is nu. So this is the probability 
that mu minus mu is less equal to epsilon, and that's at least it's a complement event. So it's at least one minus two e to the minus two epsilon squared. I'm gonna box this. So we're gonna spend a little bit of time discussing it. Okay. okay. So one thing you might observe that's missing from the right hand side here is mu. So in order to compute this bound, in order to compute the probability of a bad thing happening, okay, in order to upper bound it, I need epsilon, which I get to set, and I need n, which again is indirectly set by me by, you know, by choosing the size of the sample. So I need to know epsilon and n. What about mu? So I can compute this bound ahead of time before picking the sample, okay? And I can see what size n do I need in order to make this small enough so that I'm comfortable. So in other words, the probability of a bad thing happening is small, okay? And then I can go and pick the sample of that particular size n, okay, given my epsilon that I chose. And then I look at mu and I claim that mu is equal to that. And, you know, with very high probability, I will be correct, okay? Correct modulo this epsilon deviation. Okay. But where is mu in here? It's not there. It's not a typo. There is no mu in here. So in other words, I can calculate this bound without knowing mu. Okay. So mu is absent. Okay. And I want to emphasize and re-emphasize how important that is. Because if mu was in here, I couldn't compute that bound and I wouldn't be able to compute the, the, the satisfactory n that will give me a low enough probability of that. And why is that? For the simple reason that I don't know mu. Okay. So this is fantastic because I don't know mu. Another thing that's missing from this whole picture is the size of the bin. Size of the bin. Size of the bin. Okay, how many people are you uh, uh, talking about in the U.S.? Three hundred and fifty million could be a billion, could be a trillion, could be infinite. Okay, there's no size of the bin in here. That means that this gift from Hufting, this Hufting bound, applies to the bin no matter what its size. Actually, the bin could have size one, two, three, five hundred, hundred million, infinity. The size of the bin is irrelevant. What matters is not the size of the bin, but the size of the sample. And that's the only size that comes in here. That's very crucial. Okay. So I'm just pointing out some properties of this bound. In fact, the, the fact that the, 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 the unknown population fraction mu is not part of the bound, even though it's part of defining what makes a situation bad or good. So it's part of defining that is not in the bound. That's a miracle. The size of the bin is not in the bound, but what is in the bound is the sample size and the tolerance you get to pick. So let's look at some examples. Okay, so example. <clears throat> okay. So suppose n, so let, let the sample size be, uh, Mm, 1,000. Okay. And let's consider two situations. Okay. So, n, so n equals 1,000. Okay. Then, if your epsilon is 0 0.05, so epsilon is 0 0.05, so that means that Nu minus 0 0.05 is less equal to mu, is less equal to nu plus 0 0.05. Okay. So my deviation is 0 0.05. Okay. So then when I run the experiment, okay, and I get my sample of size 1000, and then I look at the fraction of red marbles, i.e. I compute nu, okay, this will be the case 99.5. Uh, let's see, 99 point, well, 99% of the time. Okay. So what is this? This is, you know, 
So this is a good thing. Okay, so this number is 1 minus okay, twice e to the minus twice 0 0.05 squared times 1,000. And you can just compute it. Okay, and you'll find that 99% of the time, okay, when I observe nu, it'll be the case that mu is within 0 0.05 of the observed mu. What about if I relax my, you know, my, if, if, if I relax my condition, if I'm less stringent, okay, if epsilon equals 0 0.1, okay, then the number I want here is 1 minus 2 e to the minus 2 0 0.1 squared times 1,000. Okay. Now, 0 0.1 squared is 1 over 100, so this becomes e to the minus 20, so we are already guessing that this is a tiny, tiny number. Okay, and then when you do 1 minus that, it's basically 1. Okay. In fact, 99.9999, and let's see how many 9s do I have? 1, 2, 3, uh, 6 9s. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 9s, and then a 6. So 99.9999996% of the time. Nu minus 0 0.1 is within mu, is, is less equal to mu, less equal to nu plus 0 0.1. So what that means is that, you know, if my sample size is a thousand, it doesn't matter what mu is. I pick a sample of size thousand, and let's say the value of nu is 0.6. Okay, so I say mu is 0.6. Well, mu, 99, basically 100% of the time, mu will be between 0.5 and 0.7. Because my, my error in deviation here is 0.1. Okay. And can you live with that chance of being correct? Most people could live with that. 99.99999. Even that, 99% of the time, you're within 5% of the true value. Even that is livable. Okay. Shows you the power of sampling. Okay. And effectively what's going on here, effectively what's going on here is that new is what I observe, okay? I observe nu, and then I say, mm, I'm going to conclude that mu is approximately equal to nu. I'm going to conclude that. Okay? And this is how often I will be right. You know, I want to just make a small technical, you know, comment that, you know, in this experiment, you know, mu is fixed. It's nu that varies. Okay, so nu varies, and the probability, you know, Whenever you talk about a probability, there's something that's random. It's new that's random, and new and, and, and new is randomly varying. But it's just that most of the time, okay, the new will be close to mu. But there's a new slash here that if new is close to mu, then mu is close to new. Okay, so that's what's going on here. Technically, it's, mu is fixed. It's new that's varying. Okay, but you know we observe new, and then we 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 we, we see that most of the time we're in a good world in which we can reach from inside the data, i.e. reach from nu, and estimate mu, which is outside the data. Okay, so in this simple example, we see that it is possible to reach from inside the data to outside the data. And I want to summarize the conditions that are absolutely essential for us to be able to do that. So, when does new reach from in the data to outside the data to give us new? So, let's try to sort of summarize this discussion in a set of best practices, a set of, 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 and in some cases, they're not just best practices, but they are essential practices. So one, the sample is picked randomly. The sample is picked randomly. So not adversarially. And you can see how, you know, for example, if you don't pick randomly, none of these kinds of conclusions can occur. Okay. So if your sample is not picked randomly, sometimes we say that you know, there might be something that's called a sampling bias. But if the sample is not picked randomly, 
then, you know, imagine I carefully select all the Trump voters. So I carefully select all the red marbles. Then my sample is going to be red. And it says nothing about mu. It could be that most of my voters are green. Okay, most of my marbles are green. So the sample is picked randomly. Okay, that is essential. So that's the first thing that allows, you know, that is required for allowing mu to reach from inside the data and tell us about mu outside the data. The second thing is that, you know, we gave up the notion of for sure. Okay. So it's always possible that new is wrong. Okay. But we're in this world of high probability. So, you know, we gave up for sure. So we're in a world of high probability. So you can only reach from inside the, in this specific example, you can only reach from inside the data to outside the data. Okay, never for sure, but with high probability. Sometimes we say this is, you know, a probably approximately correct model, PAC. So it's probably approximately correct to say that nu is mu. So probably because it's with high probability and approximately because you have to have this epsilon. You cannot set epsilon to zero. Okay. So you're with high probability approximately correct. Okay. So we gave up the for sure. So the sample is picked randomly. Technically, the term we use for that is IID, independently and identically distributed. So each uh, marble is in IID sample from the bin. Okay. We gave up the for sure, so we're in this world of high probability. Okay. And how do we get into this world of high probability? We want as large a sample size as possible. Okay. N is large. So the larger the sample size, the more faith we have in the in, in, in the high probability nature of the conclusion. And the specific quantification of what's the probability that you're in the good world is this, or what's the probability that you're in the bad world is this. So it's related to e to the minus epsilon squared n up to some constants. Okay, so epsilon squared n, so your approximate, you know, criterion, so your epsilon squared times n should be large. More specifically, epsilon squared n should be large. So if you want to make a much stricter, tighter conclusion about mu, you're going to need a correspondingly larger n. Um, I will, uh, I will state one more, um, requirement. And you're going to look at me and, wow, that's so obvious. This guy is insulting my intelligence. Okay. But I'm just going to state it anyway, so bear with me. Four. When you take the sample satisfying conditions one, two, and three, okay, when you take the sample satisfying conditions one, two, and three, you get a new, okay, you can only apply that new to make an inference about the bin. So to make an inference about mu for the bin, from which that sample came. Okay. So new reaches out to mu for that same bin. And you look at me and say, wow, does this guy think that we are, we are so dumb that we don't know that? So what am I saying? I'm saying that if you, if you, Take a poll of people in Australia and ask them, you know, would you, would you vote for Trump or would you vote for Biden? And then you get a, you know, you get a fraction of Trump supporters in Australia. And then you try to infer from that, that, you know, Trump is going to win the election in the U.S., which is based on U.S. voters. Good luck. Okay. You're taking a new that is constructed from a sample from bin A and trying to apply it to bin B. No, no. Okay. And that looks so obvious. You say, wow, you had, you really had to state that. Well, believe it or not. Most of the total screw-ups in machine learning arise from that mistake. You take a sample from one bin and you try to apply it to another bin. Okay. And that mistake shows up in various subtle ways, okay, which we will see. Okay. But I'm stating it and you look at me like I'm some kind of you know, out of space guy, but you know, you can't argue with me. Okay. And, I, and I would like to emphasize this. Okay. But now I want to show you some of the generality of this ability to reach outside. It doesn't matter what mu is. Okay. So mu, so 
you know, generality. For all, for any mu, so it doesn't matter what the true population fraction is, and for any bin size, for any bin, And this is going to be important. So as long as I can take any problem I want and put it into this abstract framework for any bin and for any mu, nu reaches out to mu, okay, providing that I satisfy criteria one, two, three, and four. So I sample my, I pick my sample, you know, independently, IID, randomly. Okay, I've given up for sure and I'm willing to live in a high probability world. Okay. And, you know, um, I've picked a large enough sample so that the Hufting bound gives me a small enough probability of a bad thing happening because in order for me to reach from mu to mu, it must be the case that a bad thing did not happen. Okay. And providing that I'm using the same bin, I'm making the conclusion about the same bin. Okay. So now I'm going to, you know, erase this and, you know, we'll come back and we're going to talk about what the hell does this have to do? With machine learning from data because okay this is nice and this is sampling but when we when we were talking about you know learning we're talking about not learning a single number mu which is the fraction of red marbles but we're talking about learning an entire target function f okay all we've shown is that you know okay yeah yeah in this simple scenario where the goal is to learn a single number providing that you give up the for sure we can do it okay but what does this have to do with learning an entire target function f okay. so let, let me er erase the board and then let me show you now the link between this simple problem and learning. Essentially, what I'm going to show you is that learning, I'm going to transform learning in, a, in, in, in this way and that way and this way and that way. And I'm, I'm going to show you that, you know, I'm going, I'm going to end up, you know, with a bin from which I pick a sample and from which I like to do, I'd like to estimate a number mu. Okay, so I'm going to transform learning into this abstract, you know, model. And, we, and, and once I do that, I can just apply the results. Boom. Okay. And I'll have a link between machine learning, okay, between the learning problem and the sampling framework. Okay. And so then the sampling framework says that I can reach from inside to outside provided this, this, and this, and this. And so that'll apply to learning that I can reach from inside the data set to outside the data set to conclude at least something providing this, this, and this, and this. Okay. So let me erase. Look at the speed with which I erase. Woo. <clears throat> Okay, so um, let's build the link between learning and the bin model, the sampling scenario. Okay, and you know, remember, we, we, we start the entire learning discussion with the assumption that there's a target function. Okay, so think credit approval, and we have age and income. Okay, and let me, you know, just for the heck of it, try to think of what a plausible target function might look like. Well, you know, below a certain age, you can't get approved for credit. But then, you know what, when you're young, you'll need a large income to get it approved. So, you know, not approved, not approved, not approved, not approved. And at some point, you know, you're ready to be approved. And as you grow older, the, the point at which you're ready to be approved drops. But eventually, you know, you're getting too old. And now I'm going to require a little bit of a higher income. Okay? So you could imagine that the boundary between plus one and minus one, you know, for a, for a real target function that does approval of credit with respect to age and income might look something like this. So this is the target function. F. Okay. Let me emphasize that it is unknown. And just for completeness, let me just uh, mention that this is the plus one region and this is the minus one region. Okay. Now, remember that guy Malik who was sitting in the closet in the bank coming up with a, you know, a, a way to approve credit. Okay. So he came up with a way to approve credit. So let's fix his hypothesis. Now let's call it H. So fix a hypothesis. In other words, fix 
a credit approval formula, and we're calling this credit approval formula H. And remember, based on the credit score, you know, this credit approval formula might look something like, you know, a linear model, so something like this, you know, as you have high, as you get older and older, so age, income, you know, I'm gonna, you know, require less and less income from you, okay, and you know, I, if I'm using this credit score approach, then I get this linear model where this is plus one and this is minus one. Okay. And so far, it doesn't look like there's any relationship to the bin model to sampling that we talked about before. But remember, our goal for the moment is, is just something very small. Okay. Can we reach from inside the data to outside the data? Okay. So now, uh, uh, bear with me as I, you know, do something that might look a little strange. I'm going to superpose these two guys on top of each other. Okay. So now let me superpose them on top of each other. Okay. Now let me also emphasize that, you know, my fixed hypothesis is my hypothesis. So this is known. Okay. I'm going to superpose these guys on top of each other. So I have my, mm, my uh, true target function, which looks something like this. And my hypothetical one, which looks something like this. Okay. And again, this is income and this is age. Okay. Now, why did I do that? Okay. Because, you know, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the regions where these two functions agree and the regions where they disagree. Okay. So let's, let's, let's do this step by step. So, in, 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 in this region here, both F and H are plus one. So they agree. Okay. So remember, uh, technically speaking, you know, you know, income and age, this is a space and it's a space filled with points. And in this region, the two, uh, hypotheses, well, the target function and my hypothesis agree. So all the points in this space, which I'll use dots to represent, all the points in this space, uh, I'm going to color them green. Okay. And I'm, you know, I'm being a little bit, you know, meticulous about this because I want you to get a nice visual representation of what's going on. Okay. So those points are green. Why are they green? They are green because my H and my target function, which by the way, I don't know, both agree. Okay. They're both saying approve, approve, approve. Okay. What about in this region? In this region, she, the target function says reject, and my H also rejects. So on this side, okay, the target function and my H agree. So these dots are also all green. These points in this space, they are all green. Okay. All right, good. Now, the interesting region, the region in between these two curves. So let's look at, look at this region. The target function is saying reject, and my hypothesis is saying approve. Disagree. Again, here, I say reject, and the target function says approve. Disagree. I, uh, I say approve, target function reject, disagree. So, surprise, surprise, when my functions, when my hypothesis, fixed hypothesis H, and the target function disagree, I'm going to color these points red. Okay, so this is an entire region of points. Okay, so bear in mind that this is an entire region of points. And I'm coloring them all red. Look how beautifully I can color points. Woo. Okay, and you know, you might think, am I wasting your time? Perhaps, but I want to really give you a visual. Okay, so... Um, you know, think of these points, they're colored red and green, okay? Now, first question, um, do I know the red region? Do I know the green region? Okay, so do I know, do I know the red or green region? Okay, and if you think for a minute, well, you know, you know, how did I construct them? Well, I needed to compare my H with my F. And since F is unknown, the obvious answer is no. Okay. How good is my H? How good? Good is my H. Okay. So, <clears throat> in some sense, um, we're asking, 
What is the size of this red region? We're asking basically, does H approximate F? And effectively, effectively we're asking, you know, how, what's the size of this red region? We can be more so, sort of precise about that. If I were to pick a random point, okay, that point could be colored green or red. And I'm asking, you know, how good my H is? What's the probability that I get a red point? Okay. So, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, pick a random point, a random point. Okay. And there is some probability that I will get a red point. There is some so effectively quantified or, or, or sort of heuristically quantified by the size of the region, except that you can imagine that I pick points with different probabilities. So there's a probability of the red region. So pick a random point. There is a probability that I get a red point. In other words, there's a probability that, you know, if I pick a random point, let's call it x, okay, there's a probability that h of x is not equal to f of x. Okay. And that quantifies, in some sense, the error. In some sense, this is exactly related to the fraction of red points, quote unquote fraction. What we really mean now is because there are infinitely many points, the probability of getting a red point. And if you think about back to the to the bin model, that guy mu, which was the fraction of red marbles, is the probability that when I dig my hand in and pull out a marble, what's the probability it's red. So this guy here okay, is analogous to mu. Okay. Analogous to mu. But since we're not talking about a bin, we're talking about functions and so on and so forth. You know, in some sense, this is quantifying how good H is. Okay. It sort of quantifies the error that is made by H. Okay. So, and, 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 and since, and since this is quantifying the error my, made by H in all, overall, okay, it's quantifying how closely H represents F. Okay. It's something that I would certainly like to know. Okay. Now, how could I try to figure out this quantity, you know, which is this, this size of this red region? Okay. So, here's what I can do. Here's what I can do. Let me go and pick some points, some data points. Let me go and pick some points. Now, randomly, according to this probability distribution with, with, with respect to which we pick points. Okay. So, um, supposing for argument's sake that I pick this point, you know, this point, this point, and this point, okay, and, uh, you know, this point, this point, you know, that point, and uh, that point. Uh, let's say I pick a few more points. So I picked, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I picked ten points. Okay. So remember, I don't know the red and green region. So even though I've gone and picked these data points, think of them as applicants who came with particular income and age. Even though I don't, so 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 you know, even though I went and picked these data points, I don't know what are the red and green regions. Okay, I do know what my hypothesis is. So my hypothesis is going to say, you know, reject, 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 accept, 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 accept. So I know what my hypothesis would say. So the real picture doesn't have red and green regions. Okay, so the real picture looks more like this. So this was a hypothetical picture with the red and green regions unknown. But the real picture, when I pick some data points, It looks more like this. Okay, where I don't have red and green regions. Okay, I could put in, I could put in here my, my, my hypothetical, my, 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 my hypothesis, but for the moment I don't need to, but it really just has these, you know, points, you know, one here, two, three, four, five. Okay, one here, one here, so that's those, and then these three. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, you know, this guy, this guy, and that guy. Okay, so that's what 
you know, if I pick the data set, okay, that's what I would actually say. I won't see the green and red regions. Okay. But now remember, when I pick a data set, when, when, when we're approaching in the learning problem setup, you know, you give me a data set, okay, and when you give me a data set, okay, you also tell me the y values. You also tell me what's the value of f, okay. And since I know the value of h, because my hypothesis you know, is going like this, my hypothesis is going like this, so I know that the value of h, and if I know the value of f, I can actually determine the color of these data points in my data set. Okay. So I, even though I don't know the red and green regions, I do know which of my data points are colored red and green. Okay. And indeed, it would be the case that I would find that you know, this is red, green, 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 uh, green, 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 okay. Um, red, red, red. Mm. Okay. Now, if you need to pause the video and convince yourself that indeed when I pick these data points, and it doesn't matter how I pick the data points, okay, when I, as long as I have some data points, and if I know the y value, if I know f on those data points, and since I can compute h because h is mine, it's my uh, uh, candidate formula. So since I can compute h, and since I, I know y, which is f for those data points, I can compute which points are red and green. Okay. So, you know, let me remove the black dots from here now. Okay. No. And now you will see why I went to such great efforts to color in all these red and green points, okay, and, 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 and to, you know, do it somewhat carefully, okay, because you know, what have we got here? Well, look at this. This is a bin, okay, in which there are some red points and some green points. And then I went and picked a sample, so those are the marbles, and, went, and then I went and picked a sample of points. I, I picked a sample of marbles, okay, I picked a sample of points, and for that sample, I can figure out, you know, um, what fraction are red. So, this is, okay, so this is income, this is age, and this is a sample in which we can compute the fraction of red. So this is mu. Uh, sorry, this is nu, the fraction of red in the sample. Okay, and I'd I'd really like to know, for the moment, I'd really like to know what's the true probability of getting a red. What's the true fraction of red in this space? Okay, so that is mu, mu equals the true uh, fraction of red in the bin. Okay, so we have a bin with red and blue, uh, red and green marbles. We pick the sample with some red and some green. We can compute the fraction new of red marbles in my sample. And we would like to know the fraction of red marbles in the bin. And Hufting says, this is exactly the bin model setup. And Hufting says that Providing that 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 some 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 conditions are met, providing that some conditions are met, okay, you can reach from new to mu. Okay. So providing some conditions are met, Hofting says, you know, providing some conditions are met, new is approximately equal to mu. You can reach from the sample mu to the bin mu. Okay. And it doesn't matter what mu is, and it doesn't matter the size of the bin. Very important. Doesn't matter what the bin is. Okay. Doesn't matter what the bin is. What matters is the sample size, the fact that the sample was picked IID, okay. and we've given up a for sure conclusion. Okay. And the larger the sample size, the, 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 the tighter this link. But, you know, Providing that those conditions are met, we can reach from new to mu. Now, from new to mu. Now, let's change the notation a little and get into the notation that we will be using when we, when we talk about learning from data, when we talk about machine learning. So this mu, okay, this fraction of the true bin that's red, that's outside the data. Okay, 
and it quantifies, it's, it sort of quantifies, you know, the error that is made by H outside the data. So we will use E for error, okay, and we will define E out as the probability that H of X is not equal to F of X. E out is the probability that h of x is not equal to f of x. That's exactly this area. Okay. And this is the probability. This is, is, is think of this as a fraction of red marble. And this is exactly analogous to mu in the bin model. It's mu. Okay. Now, in the sample, we had this fraction of red marbles. Okay. So we can, we can now explicitly compute this fraction. It's, 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 it's the fraction of data points on which H and F disagree. So this fraction nu is the sum over my data points from N equals 1 to big N, if I had big N data points, of, and I'm going to do a Boolean indicator function, H of XN is not equal to F of XN. Or let's put YN here. Okay, so don't, don't, don't worry too much. This is just a Boolean indicator function that says I'm equal to 1 if this is true and 0 otherwise. So it's just counting. This sum just counts the number of disagreements between H and Y on the data on the sample. Okay, and let's, okay, now if we want the fraction of disagreements, we have to divide by N. Okay, and since this is, this is also a kind of error. It's an error between H and F, but only on the data. Okay, but it's in the data. Okay, it's in sample. So we say that this is an, this is an in sample error and this is an out of sample error. So we will define this as E in is equal to that. Okay, and if I wanted to be very technical and specific, I would have to mention that, you know, this is for my H and this is for my H. Okay, where H is this fixed hypothesis. Okay, now, Huffing says, so this is exactly analogous to nu. So there's my link. Okay. So in the setup of a target function and a fixed hypothesis S, F, R, H, I've managed to construct a bin and the sample and the fraction of red marbles. Okay. And I have a bin from which I've sampled. So Huffing says that nu reaches to mu, which is exactly in this new notation that the in sample error reaches to the out of sample error. Okay. So Huffding says okay and I'll put this in now the technical term because I can simply quote requote those formulas but just replace new with e in and mu with e out. Huffding says that the probability that um, e in of h i.e. new minus e out of h, i.e. mu, the probability that this thing is uh, greater than epsilon is at most 2 uh, e to the minus 2 epsilon squared n. Okay. And the right, remember, the right-hand side does not depend on e out, which we do not know. It depends on the tolerance you pick and the, the size of your sample, or equivalently the probability. So this is the probability that we used to call a bad thing occurs, and this is the probability that um, E in, and we can re rephrase this as the probability that E in of H minus E out of H is less equal to epsilon, so the complement and the probability of a good thing occurring is at least one minus two E to the minus two epsilon squared. So I don't need to derive this, okay? This is exactly following from, you know, the bin model, because this is a sampling scenario. Okay, and so that's the link between this setup where I have a target function and a fixed hypothesis H and the sampling slash bin model. Okay, what does it say? Okay, what does it say? It says that E in reaches out to E out. Okay, okay. modulo the technical probability here that, you know, there's a, it doesn't reach out for sure. It reaches out within some error tolerance epsilon and with high probability. So E in of H is approximately equal to E out of H and approximately equal to is where the epsilon comes in. Okay. With high probability. 
this is where the 2 e to the minus 2 epsilon squared n comes in, or 1 minus of that, with high probability. Okay, and what is this saying? Okay. This is saying that, you know, if I have my fixed hypothesis h, okay, then by looking at how that h is performing on the sample, I can conclude something about that h outside the data. Namely, I can conclude that its overall performance okay, is represented by its performance on the sample. Okay. So, specifically, if E in of H is approximately zero, then E out of H is approximately zero within my error tolerance epsilon. And have I learned anything? Yes, because E out of H approximately zero means that with high probability, so the region where H is not equal to F is small. Okay? So this means that F is approximately equal to H outside the data. And I've reached outside the data. And I can now conclude that my hypothesis H is good. What if E of N of H is not approximately zero? If E N of H is much, much bigger than zero, then E out of H is also much, much bigger than zero. It's not as useful a conclusion. It's, it just says that my hypothesis H is bad. It doesn't approximate, you know, doesn't approximate F. I have still learned something outside the data, but approximately with high probability. Okay. So F is not approximately equal to H outside the data. So I've still learned something outside the data. Okay. So this is nice. I can, in the learning scenario, or the scenario that we have built, as sort of with the, the, the setup in which we are trying to learn, where we have a target function and then we have, you know, we pick the hypothesis H, which is now fixed. In this, you know, in this learning scenario, it is possible to reach from inside the data to outside. And that was our goal, to establish that, you know, we can link to outside from inside, which looked impossible before. Okay. And what did we have to sacrifice? We had to sacrifice the for sure. But what did we gain? We gained this immense power of being able to reach from inside the data to outside the data, which looked impossible. But now we see that it is possible, providing that, you know, providing that we give up the for sure. Okay. So, okay, let me summarize. And I will come. Uh, let me summarize. Um, so let's erase and summarize. Okay, so um, let's compare the bin model and then so the bin. So on the left, I'll draw, I'll, I'll summarize the bin model. Okay, so you know, in the bin model, you have a bin, you have red and green marbles, so you have green marbles, and you have red marbles. Okay, what do you do? You pick a marble randomly. Okay, so we pick a marble randomly, pick randomly. Okay, and you have a sample size of size n, that means you pick n marbles, you know, n uh, equals sample size. Okay. And then we define some quantities, so we define a new, equals the, the in sample fraction of red, fraction of red, and mu equals the, you know, Population fraction of red, the true fraction of red in the bin. The population fraction of red. Okay. Now, corresponding to this setup in the, in the sampling bin model, we have the learning scenario that we set up. So, in the learning scenario, okay. so here we had a target function f and a fixed hypothesis h. Malik's credit approval function x. So fixed, okay, fixed but unknown. Okay. 
Okay, so F is fixed and unknown, H is fixed. Okay, so now, so what's the equivalent of the bin in the learning scenario? Was the input space X. So the input space, no, let's call it script X. Okay, now, similar to, to red and green marble, we had, you know, green and red X's. Okay, now what does that mean? In, in, the, in the learning scenario, what, what a green X was, was that, you know, my hypothesis agrees. So H of X equals F of X. Okay. And for the red X's, my hypothesis, my hypothesis does not agree. So H of X is not equal to F of X. Okay. Now, you know, picking randomly from the bin, so, so you, you, you dig your hand in there and pick, you know, a marble according to, let's say, the probabilities of marbles in the input space, uh, in the, in the learning scenario. You know, the, the, there's a probability distribution that's defined over your input space and you, and, and you generate an X value, uh, uh, a set of attributes for your applicant. You generate the X value according to this probability distribution. So there's a probability distribution, your X. We didn't spend much time on it, but you can, you, you, you can understand what's going on here is that you have your input space and, and there's some generator of data, some random process that's generating data. We call that the probability distribution for X and the sample size is just the size of the, Data set. So the number of number of examples generated. So this is dn equals x1, y1, x2, y2, up to xn. Importantly, each x is accompanied with a y value. Okay? And so that means that in this data set we can identify which of these x's are red or green by looking at what is H on this X and comparing to the Y. Okay. So we define the in sample error, which is exactly analogous to U. Okay. So the in sample error, E in of H is one over N. Okay. And now we, we add up the errors made on this data. Okay. So it's the sum from I equals one to big N of the indicator of whether H of XI is, is um, not equal to In sample error, exactly analogous to new, and the out of sample error, which is exactly analogous to new. Okay, so E out of H is equal to the probability that H of X is not equal to F of X. Okay, nice. There's a one to one correspondence between everything in the bin model and everything in the learning scenario, and that's what allowed us to conclude via Hofting. So Hofting says, what does Hofting say? Hufting says here, Hufting says, so Hufting says that you know, new, says that new is approximately equal to new. Okay, and you know, what does this approximately mean within some epsilon which you get to define? And this is not always the case, so with high probability. Okay, and there's a, uh, you know, e to the mark. 2e to the minus 2 epsilon squared n that governs the probability that you fail to make a correct conclusion when you claim this. And similarly, in the learning scenario, Huffington says exactly borrowing this result into this uh, scenario says that e out of h is approximately equal to e in of h. Nice. The epsilon is coming in here and defining what does it mean to be approximately equal to, and again, not for sure. With I probably. Okay, so that's good. But there is a problem. Looks like oh, you know, we, we have been able to learn, we've been able to port the learning scenario to the bin model, and we're done. Not quite. Why? Because if you think about this, okay, you know, what does this say? This says that if E in of H is small, then E out of H is small. And so, and so, you know, H is approximately equal to F outside the data. Okay, because E out has to deal with outside the data, and that's fantastic. Okay, and what that means is that we have learned. Okay, we can take this H and we can use it with confidence it, up to some probability, up to some high probability. We can use it and, you know, be reasonably assured that, you know, we will be able to approximate that. Okay. On the other hand, if E in of H is large, that similarly means, because E out is approximately equal to E, that similarly means E out 
of h is large, imply that h is not approximately equal to f. The rod of luck. Okay. Now, the fundamental thing that's going on here that is missing from the learning that we the learning setup that we had before was that if you think about it, we have no control over e in. Okay. So we have no control, no control over e in. It is what it is. It depends on two things, on f and h, and you know, the specific samples you got, okay, the specific data that you got, but we have no control of it. We, we sort of run this experiment, then we compute e in, we look at it, and we see it's small, oh good, I'm happy, I've got a good h. It's large, oh no, I'm done, I've got a bad h. Okay. And rather than learning, we should, it's, it's better to term this experiment verification. So this is not learning. Even though it's a, it's a scenario very similar to learning, it's actually verification. So this is verification. So this is verification, not learning. Okay, and it's very important to sort of distinguish between these two. So, I, so what, we have, what we are saying here, and it's still a step, it's a very big step. Okay? What we are saying here is that we can use data to reach from, it. we can use the data to reach outside the data by computing E in and then reach out to E out. So we can use data, but in a limited setting. Okay. In the setting of verification, where you give me a fixed hypothesis H, I can verify it. Okay. So let's contrast verification to learning, just to be explicit. And by the way, for those of you who are wondering, you know, why we need to fix things ahead of looking at the data, this might answer some of your questions. So let's compare verification to learn. So in verification, we have a fixed hypothesis H. Okay, now that's very important. Verification, we have a fixed hypothesis H. In learning, you don't have a fixed hypothesis H, so this hypothesis H is fixed, and when you see the data, all you're doing is verifying H. You don't get to change H. That was the setup we just described. In the learning setup, the hypothesis is not fixed. The final hypothesis is not fixed because it depends on the data. So, in, in, in learning, you have a fixed hypothesis set H, big H. And um, the goal in verification is you produce this H, and I'm going to certify that H is good. That's the goal in, in, in verification. But the goal in learning is not to certify the hypothesis set H. It's to certify a particular hypothesis G that is picked from H using the data. So, let me emphasize here, the data is only used to certify H. In learning, the data has two uses. That is the complication. So, the first thing the data is used for, so you use data, data, to pick G from H. So, that's the first thing you use the data for. And then the second thing you use the data for, so here we use the data, to certify that H is good. Here we use the data to pick G, and then we have to use the same data, use the same data to certify G. So the crucial difference is H cannot, it does not depend on the data, it's fixed ahead of time. Here G depends on the data. And that's what's the complication. So in the verification setting, you you use the data to compute E in of H, and you don't have any control. You don't have any control over it. In the learning scenario, you 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 have you you you, you can certainly compute E in of G, so you can compute E in of G. But more importantly, 
you know, the E in of G, the, the, the G that you pick will have the smallest E in, the smallest in sample area. It will be the G that looks best. Your G looks best on data, i.e. you pick G with minimum E in. That means that you control the in sample error of the, the final hypothesis G that you wish to certify. You control E in of G. In fact, you're getting it as low as possible, typically, by choosing the best looking hypothesis from your hypothesis. Okay, now, we can apply Hufting in this scenario. So, we can apply Hufting in this scenario. Let me show you pictorially what this scenario looks like and give you an analogy. So when we certify, you know, uh, um, H, we compute E in over which we have no control and we say that E, e out of H is approximately E in of um, H. So that's the applying of Huffing in this scenario. If we wanted to apply Huffing in this scenario, we would like to make a claim that E out of G, notice the difference, this is a fixed H, this is a G that came out of a picking process, or out of a choosing process. We would like to claim that E out of G is approximately equal to E in of G. And it turns out that because of this fundamental first step where we use the data to pick G, okay, and then, okay, we use the, the data to certify G. But here we only use the data to certify. Because we are using the data to pick G, you cannot apply apply Huffney. Okay. Now I'm going to illustrate to you why you cannot apply Huffney. Okay, at, at an intuitive level, I'll, I'll first I'll show you what's going on here. Okay, and and then I'll show you some an example, for example, in medical testing, where you know if you were to apply Huffney to the G that pops out of here, it would be a disaster. Okay. And it's absolutely important for us to be able to apply Huffington here that, that the hypothesis was fixed before you look at the data. And that started to give you a hint. Many people ask this question, why does the hypothesis set have to be fixed before you look at the data? And that's because we're going to sort of derive, later on, we're going to derive, we're going to sort of modify Huffington, we're going to adapt Huffington so that we will be able to make this conclusion. And just like here, to make the Huffing conclusion here, that we can verify an H, it was important for this guy to be fixed ahead of time. To, to obtain the Huffing type conclusion here, it will be absolutely critical that the hypothesis set was fixed ahead of time. And if it's not fixed ahead of time, if you're allowed to change it at will, then you will never be able to verify that the final hypothesis is good. So let me pictorially illustrate what's going on here. So what's going on here is you have a hypothesis set. Okay, so we have a hypothesis set of hypotheses. Let me call it H1, H2, H3, H4, up to Hm. I'm just heuristically listing it as you know um, finite hypothesis set. Although most of the popular hypothesis sets are not finite. So each hypothesis set, remember, it reduces to a picture of this form. Each of these hypothesis sets reduces to a picture of this form. Okay. So each of these hypotheses set can be made analogous to a bin, where there's going to be a green region. Okay, there are going to be green regions, okay, and, and red regions. Okay, there are going to be green regions and red regions. So each hypothesis has its own out of sample error, its own mu for the B. Okay, so there's E out 1, E out 2. E out 3, E out 4, and so on, E out N. So e out. Each of them has its own out of sample error corresponding to mu1, mu2, mu3. So what is this E out? This E out is a probability, a probability that if you randomly generate a point, you end up in the red region. So this is this is exactly a probability. So it's basically a probability which I could call E1, E2, E3, E4. Now, what do you do? You generate a data set. So you generate a data set. 
and generate some points, okay, and it's the same points in each. Okay. And you're going to use these points to evaluate each hypothesis. Each of these gets an E in 1, H1, E in H2, E in H3, E in H4, and so on, E in Hn. Okay. But now, here's the key. Okay. And this is the problem. You're going to go and you're going to pick, let's say this guy managed to, you know, uh, let's say this hypothesis managed to separate the green from the, from the red uh, perfectly. So all the data points here were green. So you pick this guy and that guy becomes blue. Okay. So this is what's happening in there. So the data is used to pick this guy because all the data points ended up green here. Okay. And then, we would like to now ask the question, is G approximately equal to F, i.e. we would like to certify. And we only have one data set, so we can only certify with that same data set. And the fundamental reason why we cannot apply nothing is because we are choosing, so we are, we are biasing ourselves towards low E in, okay, and, and that by, 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 and that's occurring because we choose, we select the hypothesis. And that notion of choice comes with a price. And that notion of, and that ability to choose is coming with a price. And that price is exactly the fact that you won't be able to conclude that E in is equal to E out. Okay. Now, let me give you an example to show you, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a sort of a drastic way why that is the case. So imagine instead of hypotheses, we had, you know, a thousand monkeys. So monkey one, that is my drawing of a monkey. Okay, so we have monkey one, monkey two, we have monkey one, monkey two, and so on. We have a thousand monkeys, monkey thousand. Okay, whatever. Funny looking monkeys. Okay, now you have, and, and you want to figure out, you know, which is the smartest monkey. That's sort of like what we're doing here. We have a bunch of hypotheses, and we want to figure out what is the smartest hypothesis with respect to the problem. In other words, which hypothesis has the largest green region? So you want to figure out what the smartest monkey is. But the unfortunate thing is all the monkeys are equally random. So you ask them a question, you ask them an A, B question, and they're going to answer randomly, A or B. It's just, just, that's just the way monkeys are. Okay. And so what you do is you administer a five-question A, B multiple choice test on each monkey. Okay. So you apply a five-question multiple chat test, one, two, three, four, five questions, where the answer is either A or B. So, you know, you have A, B, A, A, B. So each monkey randomly picks either, you know, the left button or the right button, saying A or B. So you administer this test to all the monkeys. Well, you must have a lot of spare time. Okay, so each monkey answers the, the test. And then, lo and behold, what you're going to do, okay, is you're going to try to find the monkey which got all the questions right. Okay, so in theory... So, so perhaps monkey star, here's a monkey star, let's call this guy monkey star, the genius monkey, you know, got all five right. All five right. Okay, so you say, ah, I have found my monkey that can answer math questions. Okay, this monkey is a genius. This monkey is a genius. Now, what am I doing when I claim that this monkey is a genius? I'm saying that you know, it's in sample error, it's ability to get all five questions right, translates to its true intelligence. And, and that's what I'm saying. I'm saying that the E in of the monkey, monkey star, is equal to, approximately equal to E out of monkey star. But now let's think about this. Okay. You know, since the monkey answers the questions randomly, there's a 1 in 32 chance that this monkey gets it right. So there's a 1 in 32 chance that this monkey gets it right. Okay. And this is one of the subtle things that, that, that creeps in when we, when we move into this world of with high probability. So this is with high probability, right? That's something like, you know, that's something like a 96% chance that this monkey gets it right. So with high probability, uh, sorry, with, 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 with high, with, uh, with, 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 uh, Small probability, you know, this monkey will get everything right. With small probability, this monkey's in sample error is different from its true intellect. Its true intellect is just random, 0 0.5. Okay. But there's a small chance, that a 1 in 32 chance, that we're going to think this monkey is a genius. Okay. Even though its true intellect is a 50-50 shot. Okay. And there's a small chance, 1 in 32, that we're going to think this monkey is 
you know, a genius. And similarly, with each of these monkeys, there's just a very small chance, 1 over 32. Okay. So any given monkey has a small chance of being considered a genius. But now, because I've given myself a thousand tries, okay, it's, it's almost a probability, 1, that, you know, that some, one, some monkey will appear to be a genius because I've given myself many, many trials and each trial has a small chance of failure. Okay. But sooner or later, one of these trials will work. And when, and we can even compute that probability. You can sit down and compute the probability that, you know, you know, the, the, the probability that at least, in fact, the expected number of monkeys which get everything right is approximately 30. So a thousand over 32. You'll, you'll find a, approximately that many genius monkeys in here, but none of them are geniuses. So somehow E in for the monkey is not equal to E out for the monkey. Okay. And of course, you know, I'm not trying to say that our hypotheses are as, as dumb as monkeys, but the same principle applies. I have a bunch of monkeys. I'm trying to figure out which monkey is the genius monkey. Okay. So I administer a test on each monkey. Okay. And for each monkey, you know, the test will determine almost correctly, or will determine correctly with very high probability whether or not this monkey is a genius. Okay. Because I have so many choices, sooner or later, one of those monkeys will appear to be a genius. One of those hypotheses will appear to be a true hero when in fact it's not. And this is basically why the Huffington bound breaks down in comparing E in of G to E out of G. It's that this notion of choice that I have so many attempts, I have so many chances to con myself that sooner or later I will con myself. And this is something that we are going to have to address if we want to be able to certify the final hypothesis that comes out of learning. Okay. So now let me um, uh, show you an example of this, this, this sort of trap that can arise in medical testing. Okay, so um, let me show you a cartoon of how this notion of choice enters into this, this, this big field of medical testing. So you know, the girl has the hypothesis here that um, jelly beans cause acne. So is it true or false? And you know, so the boy says, well, I don't know, but let me enlist some scientists and they go and the scientists do the, the, the correct thing. They get a control group, they get a treated group and the treated group is given jelly beans. So that's a very, you know, very happy treated group, and then the scientists uh, do their statistical analysis and say, you know, um, you know, jelly beans do not cause acne. Okay, and how certain are you that the conclusion of your your experiment is correct? So that's the uh, the, the, the essential question of does the in sample uh, reach out to the out of sample? So you, your sample says there's no effect of jelly beans. How certain are you that your conclusion is correct? Okay. And, and they say, well, ninety nine point five percent. So, so you know, there's a half a percent chance at best that, you know, or, or, that I'm wrong. or maybe I'm 95% certain. So there's a 5% chance that I'm wrong. But then the girl says, whoa, 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 maybe it's not jelly beans, but it's jelly beans of a specific color that cause acne. Okay, so back to the drawing board for the scientists. And the scientists try all the various colors, purple, brown, pink, blue, teal, you know, they run, you know, in this, in this example, they've run something like 20 experiments. Okay. Now, you know, you know, most of these experiments are saying there's no, no relationship. But look, you know, um, we found a link between green jelly beans and um, acne. Okay. Now, you ask the scientists, how certain are you of each of these experiments? Oh, each of these experiments were 95% certain. So there, there's only a 5% chance that the conclusion of experiment 1 with purple jelly beans is wrong. And then the conclusion of experiment 2 with brown jelly beans is wrong. Okay, so, you know. Whatever the conclusions coming out from each of these 20 experiments, it's, it's overwhelmingly likely that, you know, the conclusion of each experiment when, when looked at independently is, 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 is wrong. And, and I'm going to hone in on now on this experiment with green jelly beans, which shows the relationship. And, you know, there's only a 5% chance it's wrong. Okay. And so, you know, it must be the case that green jelly beans cause pain. Okay, and then, you know, the manufacturer of green jelly beans goes out of business because what's, what, you know, because, you know, we all know what comes next is the headline. Oh, green jelly beans linked to acne. Now, let's go back here. Okay. 
And let me show you where the notion of choice has corrupted this step. The real question we should be asking here is not, you know, how accurate is each experiment? Okay. But the real question is, how accurate is it after we make the choice of which experiment to look at? Okay. So, mathematically, this could be formulated as, what are the chances that, you know, one of these experiments is wrong? And when you do 20 experiments and each has a 5% chance of being wrong, it's overwhelmingly likely that one of these experiments is wrong. And that could easily be the experiment with the green jelly beans. Okay. So when you give me the, abil the ability to choose the experiment to look at, I shouldn't be looking at, you know, in some, in some sense, the average probability that these experiments are wrong. But I should be looking at what's the probability that I happen to choose the wrong experiment. If I do 20 experiments, one of them is going to be wrong. And that one could be the one that's wrong. Okay. So that's the problem with the analysis. We can't conclude that, you know, green jelly beans are bad. Another way of doing this is I'm going to keep doing medical tests. You know, I tested this cancer drug, it failed. I tested this COVID drug, it failed. Okay, I changed the drug a little. I test again, but I get another 10 people. Okay, it failed. I changed the drug a little bit, get another 10 people. It failed. You know, if I keep doing this experiment, okay, Eventually, just by randomness, because just by, by accident, you know, I, I find a group of 10 people, all of whom the drug worked for, I'm going to conclude eventually that it succeeded. Okay. And that is very similar to this notion of choice. Okay. I'm choosing how long to continue doing experiments and I'm choosing to stop when my drug succeeds. Okay. If I really wanted to test, now I need to retest the drug where I don't have choice, where I fix the drug and go and do another test. And if medical testing occurred that way, you would find far less drugs on the market. Anyway, signing off for now.